The Road Accident Fund commenced operations in 1997 and is responsible for providing appropriate cover to all road users within the borders of South Africa. It is also responsible for rehabilitating and compensating persons injured as a result of motor vehicles in a timely and caring manner and actively promoting the safe use of all South African roads. But how is it really faring, you know, practically and where and how can we seek to improve this offering for South Africans? Mahai to Dumelang, good evening. My name is Tabo Mulukwan. Welcome to this edition of Soweto Today. Tonight we take a look at the Road Accident Fund and better understand its uh, claim processes and get to the bottom of the backlog and delays that the system is experiencing and how they plan to turn this around with the help of South African citizens. Now joining me via Zoom uh, to have this conversation is Macintosh Polela, who is the Head of Corporate Communications at the Road Accident Fund. He's joining me um, this evening. Macintosh, much appreciated for joining me. Welcome to the show. Thank you and thank you for inviting me. Much appreciated. I mean, for the sake of clarity and, uh, you know, context, maybe can you please just tell us more about um, exactly how is the Road Accident Fund uh, works and, you know, the different functions that it performs? So, look, the Road Accident Fund exists uh, with two purposes. The main one being the claims process, as like you've said in your intro, we exist to assist people and rehabilitate them after the unfortunate um, incident of getting involved in a car accident. But number two, a lot of people don't know that we also have a responsibility through our legislation to be involved in road safety. As I talk to you, I'm at Oratambo Airport on my way to Nelspreit because we are going to be part of the uh, Metro Awards. We've decided to go where people enjoy themselves just to remind them. I mean, we take over the stage and we have messaging. This is part of our road safety. So two purposes from our side. We do claims and we do road safety. Mm. I mean, so who qualifies for road accident fund assistance? And, uh, you know, uh, people would want to know what are the specific circumstances under which, uh, you know, you guys get involved. So anybody who gets involved in an accident within the borders of South Africa qualifies, um, you know, to claim at the um, road accident fund. How we get involved is... After you get involved in an accident, you obviously will find yourself in a hospital or a, cl or a clinic where you, the doctors will obviously have a record of your, of your injuries. And the next person to be your friend is obviously the police because then the police will confirm the accident and also fill out the forms that will confirm to us that you were involved in an accident. And obviously, at the moment as we stand, then go to a lawyer who will then, uh, you know, start the process of, uh, of claiming. But I must say that we have a bill in Parliament where we have said we're encouraging people to come directly to us and we want to, in the future, do away with the lawyers altogether. Mm. I mean, speaking about lawyers there, um, you know, um, um, you know I, I just want you maybe to put it in layman terms, uh, you know, particularly looking at uh, who can come to... Um, uh, you know, the Road Accident Fund for uh, representation. Um, do you guys have, you know, a specific team that deals with that? Because we've seen a lot of incidences whereby either uh, legal representation of, uh, you know, um, a motorist, uh, someone who was involved in, 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 in an accident, uh, maybe gets ripped off by um, their lawyers, allegedly so, if I might put it that way. Yeah, no, no, um, it's not even allegedly. In most cases, it, it, it happens. And, and, and in case, in fact, it happens quite regularly. So where we stand now, we have people that have been claiming by themselves, in other words, that have not been represented. But what we discovered is that legislation is not tight enough for people to come through to us. And what, that's why we have put forward the RAF bill of 2023. Now, when you're talking about lawyers, um, ripping people off. Unfortunately, it's a problem that we have. They don't just, uh, you know, defraud the claimants that they represent. They also def defraud the RAF um, itself. For instance, in the past three years, we've stopped fraudulent claims from lawyers to the value of 3.6 billion. And this, this financial year alone, we have stopped the uh, another fraudulent claims of 460 million. 
So there's a lot of ch taking chances, both, both from the side of the lawyers and both from the side of the claimants uh, you know, themselves. And in some instances, obviously, there has to be um, a report from a, a health facility. And we find that sometimes doctors are involved as well. So the problem is so much that we've said, you know, you, you can quite easily and, and, and successfully claim monies from Sasa. You can quite successfully claim monies from NFSAS. And we've said, likewise, it's a bizarre situation where you have a social benefit of the state mm. and the state itself encouraging people to sue them to get this social benefit. So what we're saying is that people should come directly to us. So, but we're going to wait for the legislators in parliament to turn that bill into an act and then we can, we can kickstart it. But as it stands now, we encourage people to go through the lawyers because that's all that we have. Even with the problems, uh, you know, that we've just, you've just mentioned. Mm. Um, so in terms of the documentation and supporting documents uh, that one needs when approaching the uh, road accident fund, do you um, need images, you know, of the incident as well? Or what do you need? Police statements, affidavits uh, for you to, uh, pro to, to, to put in a claim? So it's quite a detailed process. Yes, you're right. We, we do need, um, you know, the, the accident report from the police. Yes, we do need your, uh, you know, comprehensive, uh, you know, uh, health report. We do need other, other documents that the lawyer will guide you as to which documents, uh, you know, you need. But obviously, in, the, in, in, in case our bill passes and we, exp we expect it to pass uh, from Parliament, we will simplify the process. We are already in the process of simplifying the processes. Simplifying it enough that, as I said, some people have been coming through to us directly and claiming directly. But again, the legislation is just not tight enough for that. So we do encourage people to still go to their lawyers. And Tosha, let's take a quick head break. When we come back, I want us to touch on, um, you know, just to get deep into some of the, you know, processes also of uh, claiming there and some of the awareness campaigns that you guys are having as RAF. We're going to take a quick head break. When we come back, we continue with the conversation. Do stay with us. Welcome back. You're still watching. So it's today. Much appreciated for joining us. Before the ad break, we started the conversation on the Road Accident Fund in South Africa with the head of corporate communications, Macintosh Polela. He still joins us via Zoom to continue the conversation. Macintosh, much appreciated for staying on. I mean, uh, we touched on various issues, particularly looking at uh, you know the processes that one has to uh, undergo uh, when you are putting a claim there. But you know, um, I, I want to talk about. Um, uh, the, the the challenges, particularly looking at, uh, I mean, with documentation with regards to uh, claims being processed. I mean, maybe can you tell us more about this? Uh, because I've I, I, I've seen people complaining that actually uh, there is some sort of a challenge that's going on. There, maybe you can take us through that. When you when you're talking about it, some sort of a challenge, it's actually an understatement. We have huge problems. Uh, so. At the RAF, what we do is we aim to process your claim within 120 days. That's give or take four months. But we can only process your claim fully if we have all the documentation at hand. It makes it easier for us. The problem that we run into is that the representative of the claimants, in this case the lawyers, they run through the 120 days by not giving us the full complement of the documents, which yeah. prevents us from closing the files. Why do they do that? Because the longer the claim stays with them, they are able to generate legal and administrative fees. And hence you find that 80 to 82 percent of our claims end up at the corridors of the courts or the steps of the courts. Why corridors of the steps of the courts? Because they don't go inside before a judge to be to be argued. Because in any case, there was nothing to argue. Once we've given you that offer within the 120 days, the lawyers either refuse the offer or they just don't give us the document. Mm -hmm. The reason that they take it all the way to court is because it takes a long time for each case to go to court. And once you get there, you don't even see a judge. They then say, oh, no, let's, let, 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 let's, let, let, let's have an agreement. And then it's assigned at the steps of the, of the court, something that has, could have been done within that 120 days anyway. But because it's not in their interest to close the cases, that's why they take so long. 
Yeah. So what happens when, uh, you know, a claim is taking more than 10 years? I mean, well, you know, uh, people that have been waiting for, um, you know, the road accident fund to pay their claims. I and mean, uh, they would say that the accident happened 10 years ago, 15 years ago. What seems to be the problem? Is it an issue of mixed messaging between them and their lawyers? Or probably the lawyers are just playing a certain game that we don't understand? It's a combination of issues. So the, the, the once once the claims are that long, like your five years or three years, your five years and longer, we call them dormant claims. They become dormant either because the people have died, they become dormant either because the people have lost their numbers. And believe me, we have many, many cases where people file claims and then they lose the phone and they change the numbers instead of doing a SIM swap. And we're doing this backlog, uh, you know, awareness because we're encouraging people to please stick to their contact details and stick to their numbers. We have even instances where we're ready to pay people. And when we try to pay them at the bank, you find that the bank, the banking t details are no longer active. So it's a combination of issues, but mostly it's because, you know, lawyers have, have abundanced those cases. People have gone to the lawyers and the lawyers found other cases that were more lucrative and they, they just abundance those people. But mm -hmm. I must say that in cases that are more than 10 years are, are, are few and far between, but we have too many cases. Too many cases that we consider as part of the backlog. Those are the ones that were done before the year 2021. We have in our books currently 351,000 cases, claims. That's unacceptable to us. And hence, we. we, we um, are you saying 351,000? I mean, cases that have not been resolved at this stage. That 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 have not been resolved. And hence, we've come to people like you and said, please, can you help us notify people that we have a huge backlog? We need these people to come forward. If you did a claim and you changed numbers, please get in touch with us on 87 We opened a call center in October last year that's very working very, very well. Because what used to happen before was that you never used to know anything until the lawyer comes back to you three, four years later and say, your case is closed. Now you can check your claim mm. at any given time, the number that I've just given, and I'll give it to you later again. And what you also need to do is to pressure your lawyer to say, have you received all the documents from myself? Have you received all the documents from the, uh, you, you know, from the health institution? Because the lawyers are sitting deliberately on the claims. Mm. Okay, now let's talk about the plans that you have in place to address this backlog. I know that you've given up, uh, you, you've given out the numbers and stuff, but is there anything that you're doing more to get to those people? I mean, obviously, awareness campaigns are not enough, uh, but are, are you going extra mile as the road accident fund to make sure that you get to those people or the lawyers are simply just hindering that process? Believe, believe me, we're doing a lot including what I told you about trying to get them out altogether so that we can better talk directly to those people. Our awareness is very, very big and we're spending a lot of money in a lot of stations on it. You know, basically community radio stations, your commercial radio stations, your TV, your newspapers, and we're hoping to reach people. We've gone through a diverse range of media to be able to reach all the people, especially on your what you call lower LSM people who are not likely to pick up the phone and, and, call, and call us unprompted. The number that I gave you, we have made sure that you can even buzz it and even send a please call me to it because often we know that some people don't have air time to call our number. We have an SMS line. We have, we have done so many, you know, to make so many things to make sure that people are reaching us and that they are able to talk to us and say what are the problems that they are encountering and what we are finding is that lawyers are saying, are telling people that their cases are going to be closed in January 2027. And when we say, oh my goodness, how do they know mm. so far in advance? It's because it's a deliberate strategy to hold on to that claim until that year. And what happens to the person? The people are suffering and they're not receiving the monies that should be helping them get reintegrated into society. 
This is definitely, uh, you know, it's bizarre actually what the lawyers are doing. But uh, uh, my guest tonight is Road Accident Fund's Head of Corporate Communications, Macintosh Polela. They're just talking more about uh, uh, how people can uh, claim uh, or put in their claims with the Road Accident Fund. We're going to take a quick ad break. When we come back, we wrap up the conversation. Do stay with us. Welcome back. You're still watching So It's Today. Thank you for choosing to stay with us. As we get closer to the end of the show, we continue the conversation on the Road Accident Fund and understanding some of the challenges that they've been facing with regards to processing claims. Now, we'll also take a look at the challenges that uh, the Road Accident Fund has been facing with the National Mine Workers of, uh, rather, the NUMSA there. And, uh, you know, just to get the latest updates uh, there, uh, Macintosh Pulele is still my guest. Uh, that's the head of corporate community communications with the road accident fund uh, you know continue to joining us uh, via zoom there um uh, you know mcintosh i mean there's been an ongoing issue involving numsa the national union of metal workers of south africa and the road accident fund i mean they have detailed their displeasure at the way um rough is being managed and have been threatening a strike for some time now i mean we've seen back and forth uh, between you guys and them uh, we also have an audio from the official statement uh, from earlier this month detailing some of their issues i want us to just take a listen and i would like to have your response uh, to that the National Union of Metal Workers of South Africa appeared before the Labour Court on Thursday to defend the right to strike at the Road Accident Fund. The RAF claims in its papers that it falls under the social security sector and not transportation, and this NUMSA rejects with contempt because it is blatantly false. The RAF falls under the responsibility of the Minister of Transport. The RAF board is appointed by the Minister of Transport. And prior to NUMSA being recognized at the Road Accident Fund, Transport Union Satau was the majority union at RAF. Not to mention, when NUMSA was being consulted during the Section 189, RAF, as the employer, ticked transport as the sector that it falls under. The RAF management must be a bunch of lunatics if they believe that this kind of propaganda can be sustained. Furthermore, NUMSA, as the only union with the majority membership at the Road Accident Fund, was formally consulted when RAF was contemplating retrenchments under Section 189A. The RAF abandoned that process with CCMA last year but continued to implement restructuring at the company outside of a lawful Section 189 process. The only reason they raised the issue of the scope at this time is because it was a desperate attempt to block the strike and the march. The irony is that if what they are alleging were true regarding the NUMSA scope, they are basically saying that they engaged NUMSA for seven years before they realized that the union scope does not cover the road accident fund. By making this ridiculous claim, the RAF management, led by its CEO Collins Letzalo, are proving that NUMSA's claims about the gross incompetence of the RAF are correct. NUMSA wants the court to declare that the strike action by, by NUMSA at the RAF is legally protected. And the other, um, the other reason we went to court is that we want the court, we want a, declar a declaratory order to the effect that NUMSA's registered scope does not prevent it from organizing within the RAF because the NUMSA constitution covers the RAF. Megan Tosh, I mean, you heard uh, the spokesperson for NUMSA there, Pagamile Kribima Jola, just, uh, you know, uh, detailing some of their concerns there. I just want to hear your response uh, as they are saying that uh, somewhere, somehow, um, you know, um, there is a propaganda that uh, you as uh, RAF is, is, is actually pushing there. I'm not sure, what's your response uh, to, to, to those claims? So, so I'll try not to <clears throat> stoop to her level, but I will take it where she is saying that the CEO of the RAF is incompetent at the election being run to the ground. Now, coincidentally today, we received a report um, talking about major improvements that um, come out of the turnaround strategy of the CEO that um, she is calling incompetent. We've had our legal costs reduced by 75%. The strategy has also seen the reduction of legal costs 
you know, being swindled by lawyers by 3.6 billion. Now, we have also reduced by another 2.1 billion. So that doesn't sound to me like an organization that is run by somebody who is incompetent. We had a, a, a turnaround strategy called um, 2020 to 2025. We are now in 2020, 24, and we are already seeing the results of that. And also she's talking about where we've said the National Union of Metal Workers of South Africa should not be organizing in the RAF. NUMSA by its name, the National Union of Metal Workers of South Africa, should be organizing in the factories and on the mines because we don't, steal, we don't deal with steel and, and metallurgy. And I, I don't know how the previous bosses of the RAF came to recognize NUMSA. NUMSA is the organization that uh, ran down and uh, dealt the coup de grace to the South African Airways and destroyed it. And we don't want them at the Road Accident Fund organizing and trying to destroy the organization. I think we're doing just fine without NUMSA. We're saying our employees are within their right to organize with any union of their choice. We encourage them to do so just not NUMSA. They want to go on strike when we're busy with our turnaround strategy because they want to disrupt the operations just like they did with SAA, which led to the destruction of the SAA. Mekin we Josh, don't uh, yeah. want them anywhere near mm. the RAF, like I said. Yeah, McIntosh, as we wrap up yes. the, the conversation, understand what you're saying. It's, it's, it's very clear there. Please go ahead. So what happens now? Um, 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 are, are you saying that you won't be able to recognize NUMSA there um, uh, because, uh, you know, they do not fall uh, uh, in, in, in the space that uh, RAF is operating. And also, just lastly, before we uh, conclude the conversation, maybe you can give us the numbers again of, uh, you know, if people want to get in touch with RAF. So, so what happens now is, is the board is in their court. We've given them a notice to say that uh, we are getting rid of them. And they've said that they're going to court. They've been saying so for more than a month now. Let them go to court. We will meet them at the court. Now, the number is 087-820-1111. And please do call us. McIntosh Palela, much appreciated. I wish we had more time, but uh, thank you for taking the time and joining us uh, this evening. Much appreciated. That was the head we of uh, co corporate corporate. That was the head of corporate communications with the Road Accident Fund, McIntosh Polela. They're giving us an insight on the latest with the National Union of Metal Workers of uh, South Africa, as well as the current situation at the Road Accident Fund with regards to the claims that have been made and uh, need to be processed. I'm going to ask my colleagues to flight that number again uh, for you to get in touch with them uh, if you have any claims uh, that you want to make with the RAF. They are on your screen now. That's how we wrap up today's episode of Soweto Today. Remember, we love hearing from you, so please feel free to talk to us about this episode. Simply send us an email at Soweto Today at SowetoTV.co.za. Or you can call us or WhatsApp us at 081-531-8857. For myself, Tabo Mulukwane and the rest of the team, good night and thank you for watching.